audience is over here. Right? <laughs> Building's gonna tip that way, brother. <laughs> We're gonna continue our study in the book of Romans, Romans chapter one, verse sixteen today. If you recall from those that were here last week, we looked at how Paul was ready to preach the gospel and how we ought to always be willing and ready to preach or to share the gospel as well. So now we'll, he elaborates a little more on that verse 16. And he, here he writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Well, after he says he was ready to preach the gospel, he tells us he is not ashamed of this gospel. And he is not embarrassed of it. He is not ashamed to be associated with Christ. He's Amen. not ashamed to be seen preaching the gospel. Well, you might hear sometimes the saying that someone is ashamed to be seen with someone else or see, be seen somewhere. But Paul said he was not that way with the gospel. Right. Many times I think we are, I don't know if it's embarrassed or what excuse we might want to use, but we are too ashamed to spread the gospel when we have a chance. And Amen. Yet I don't believe Paul was ever that way. <laughs> All throughout the book of Acts, we see him sharing the gospel with every opportunity he had. You know, when he went to the those on Mars Hill, they didn't even know what God they were worshiping, yet he pointed them to the true God. Mm -hmm. I think most of us would say, well, they're a bunch of pagans anyway, we don't need to worry about them. Oh, and he went, he would share with the beggars and with even the rulers of his day, he wasn't afraid to speak the gospel to Felix as well as Caesar. Amen. And he could fully say he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And perhaps there were some that were ashamed, and I say many today that profess the name of Christ are ashamed or embarrassed or feel guilty perhaps of, mm -hmm. of being associated with Christ. But then he goes on to say that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'd like us to think a little bit about what is the gospel. Amen. We, we mentioned it last week that the gospel means the good news. That the bad news is that we're sinners, but the good news is that Christ died for sinners. Amen. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15 for just a moment. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Here, Paul kind of gives us a, a summary of the gospel, you could call it. Verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Mm -hmm. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Amen. So this really is the crux, if you will, the gospel, the pinnacle of it, you might say, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. But really the gospel extends to the whole life of Christ and you could even include the whole of scripture because all of it is important to the death, burial, and resurrection. For example, if Christ had not lived a sinless life, then his sacrifice would have been meaningless for eternal right. salvation. The Old Testament pointed to him and showed in types and prophecies of him. And he had to fulfill all of these things. Mm -hmm. 
Well, then just the same if he had lived a sinless life and had not died, then it would have made no difference for us. Right. He would have still been very much God and sinless, and yet if he had just been mad back to heaven, he would not have obtained eternal redemption for us, as Hebrews says. Really, the entirety of the scriptures is important to the gospel. Amen. The entirety of the life of Christ is important to the gospel, but it <coughs> culminates, if you will, in the death, burial, and resurrection. And as he'll go on to say in verse, or excuse me, in the latter part of this chapter, that without the resurrection we would be of all men most miserable. Amen. Amen. So the so the gospel doesn't have to be confined, though, to just simply the story of the cross, if we can say it that way. Right. Really, in any passage of Scripture, we can find a way to Christ, I believe. Amen. When he goes on back in our text, he says, He is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And here he, he gives us some more about the gospel, what it is. He says, For it is the power of God and the salvation. <laughs> Here we see the reason why Paul was not ashamed to preach the gospel is because it was the power of God to save him. It's the same reason we should not, or we should always be willing to share the gospel because it is the means by which God is appointed to save souls. First Corinthians chapter one. We'll turn over there for just a moment. No, brother Larry loves to quote the 21st verse. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 21. It says, For the preaching of the cross of them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Here that Paul says to the unsaved, to the lost, Preaching and specifically the preaching of Christ and the cross is seen as foolishness to them. Right. But we know it is the power of God and the salvation. Verse 19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Amen. Notice verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, he would. For the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. The preaching of the gospel is still the method in which God uses to save souls. That's it. Amen. And we see by Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it's only through the gospel of Christ. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 12. And Galatians tells us we have to preach the gospel of the Bible. Let's turn over there for a moment. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. I'm sure somewhat familiar verses to us, but Paul rebukes the Galatians here. And it says, I marvel, verse 6, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Amen. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Amen. There is only one gospel that we can proclaim. It's not the gospel of man's wisdom. It's not the gospel which many professing churches proclaim today, but the gospel is that Christ died for sinners. The man trusts in their works and their religion, sometimes in their baptism or their church membership, but the preached gospel is still God's instrument of salvation today. That Christ came, that he lived a sinless, perfect life, and that he died, paid the penalty for our sins, and rose again the third day. Amen. Any perversion of those makes it into another gospel. Right. I was 
forget, I read recently the percentage of Christians that, so called Christians, that's think that Jesus sinned, and it's a lot more than it ever should be. Mm. Something like 54% or something. You know? May. No, if Christ was sinful, then his sacrifice could not take away sin for us. You're right. Amen. We cannot forget really all of those aspects of the gospel. We can be sure he obtained redemption for those he sought to obtain it for. So we need to present the gospel that you just do what feels good to yourself. Or you just if you hope that when you stand before God you'll be okay, but the real gospel is that Christ can save you. Mm. Can save you to the uttermost and save you believe, for eternity. Right. When men present a gospel that is you can be saved and lost again, or you have to work your way to salvation, or you have to work your way to be saved. But all those are not the gospel of Christ. Right. So men trust in many things, but the biblical gospel is simply trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Let's go back to our text here in Romans, and we'll look further. We see the a two-part point here. In the next part of the verse, he says, For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. First, we see the responsibility of man in salvation. That Amen. Man must believe. But there's also a promise of God here. We'll look at it in a moment. So Christ in his own ministry in Luke chapter 13 said, Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Right. And again in Acts chapter 17 verse 30, it says that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Mm. So repentance is still a requirement. It's good. I fully believe in the doctrines of grace, but I fully believe in the responsibility of man as well. You're right. Again, Acts chapter 16, verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's it. The command was still there for man to believe. It said, well, certainly man has to be born of God. He is dead in trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians 2, 1. But yet man will be responsible for his belief or his unbelief. Mm -hmm. We cannot stand before God and say, well, God, you didn't save me. The command is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The command is to repent and follow him. That sometimes it's hard for man to reconcile that God is sovereign and man is responsible. We get those things are not mutually exclusive. They can man can be responsible while God is still very it's much it. sovereign. Amen. But after he says here that he says that it's to everyone that believeth. So we also see that's a promise of God that he will save those who believe. Well, it's not that you're going to do enough good works and when you get stand before God, you hope he's going to let you in. Many, many people today believe in a salvation like that, but I believe that is no salvation at all. Amen. No, God will save those who truly believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christ himself said, and all that come, or him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Amen. John 6, 37. Any that genuinely come to Christ, he will not cast them away. He will not say, well, I don't know, you're not one of the elect, go away. It's it. That's not what Christ does. You're right. But we can rest assured on the promise of God that if we believe in the gospel, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will save that's more sure than the sun's going to come up in the morning. 
That's more sure than Biden is going to be Biden tomorrow, <laughs> right? It's more sure than just about anything that man thinks is always going to be here. That God will save those who believe is something we can stand very firm on. Amen. And it should be a consolation to us that are saved that we have this promise that if we that we believe that He has saved us, that He's not going to lose any of us, that He's not going to turn us away when we stand before Him. We'll go to the last part of this verse and we'll close. He adds this clarifier on the end here. He says, after it's the power of God and salvation, everyone that believeth, he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Well, there's no discrimination in the gospel. Well, the Jews were the first to hear the gospel. As we'll see here the, later on in the book of Romans, he, they were given the oracles of God. They had all the types and prophecies pointing to Christ. They had the law, which Paul says in Galatians was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. They had everything that pointed them to Christ before we did. Mm -hmm. We had thanks be to God that he <coughs> extended the gospel to us as well. Amen. Yes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek, to the Gentile people. Really, we have much to be thankful for to God. But up until the time of Christ, salvation was primarily for the Jews. That's it. Aside from a handful of outsiders that the Lord saw fit to save, you only see salvation among the Jewish people. Right. But thanks be to God, he said, I have Sheep of another fold. That's it. Amen. Thanks be to God that He sent the Apostle Paul to preach the gospel throughout the Gentile world. As we, if you remember from our studies in his life, he went over to Macedonia and to Spain. Mm -hmm. and he also eventually made it over into England and came over here by the way of the pilgrims and others that came to this country. Amen. And I don't, I don't think any of that was by accident. Yet God purposed each of those things that He might bring the gospel to each and every one of us. It's almost a too much to think on when you try to think about it, how God worked out all the details to make sure that the gospel got to you when it was supposed to get to you. Mm -hmm. but thanks be to God. He. He doesn't discriminate in the gospel. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, or white, black, Hispanic. It doesn't matter if you are upper class, middle class, lower class. Amen. He said in Christ there is no difference. Mm -hmm. And we should not be ashamed of this gospel that is it's able to save all who believe on it. We also said gender doesn't matter either. There's neither male nor female. Even you can even save all made up genders. Some people might disagree with me on that, but I, I don't know of any that are outside the reach of the grace of God. Amen. That's why we should not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. Let's go ahead and close with that thought. Amen.